Hello, everybody. I am back for a few days. I will be leaving uh, this upcoming Sunday uh, to go back up north out to sea where I will be shipping out. Um, but I'm home for a few days, and during that time, I had hoped I had hoped to use some of this time to make a few uh, YouTube videos. Now, my big hope was I wanted to make at least one more of my uh, looking my examination of Karl Baugh's series, Creation in the 21st Century. Um, but when I started taking one of those apart, I realized the time that it takes for me to put those together uh, it exceeds how much time, how much free time I'm really going to have. Um, so I wanted to, do, but I wanted to do something. And so I, what I thought I would do here is um, maybe do a, a few, if I can, at least this one, um, sort of mini versions of it. Take a few, just a few points that Ball brings up and kind of go into those in some detail because I think he, there's some, some of the episodes don't really warrant their own, the whole, there, there's just a lot of other bullshit I've already addressed in them. Um, but he, they may make one or two other points that I think are worth getting into, at least as a vehicle for educational purposes. And that's what I'm going to do here. Um, this is, this one, I'm going to talk about two different concepts, uh, both involving insects. Uh, now the episode specifically is, uh, Carl Baugh's Creation in the 21st Century, an episode called Flying Wonders, uh, where he uses insect, insects as an example of creationism. All right, the, the two points that I want to talk about, well, one Baugh brings up and one, one he doesn't specifically address, but I still think it's, it's important. Uh, they both are reliant on, on this irreducible complexity concept. Uh, one is the Bombardier Beetle, uh, which you know has been often touted uh, from going way back to Dwayne Gish's old material as an example of, of irreducible complexity. Um, of course, he completely fucks it all up. Um, it doesn't, you know, he misrepresents it, and Ball repeats the misrepresentations. Surprise, surprise. Um, and the other one is an example of commensalism, um, obligate mutualism. Which is another thing that creationists you'll see in a lot of creation literature examples of of this kind of of this mutualism. You know, a, a fly that can only pollinate one species of orchid, and the orchid and the fly are wholly dependent on each other. And they say, look, look at this. This you know, how can evolution explain this mystery? Uh, when in fact we can explain it very well. Um, but anyway, there's so there's there's two points in this that I want to bring up. But before I get into it in too much detail, I do want to give a, just a briefest background um in in about beetles because i think it it it'll it'll be it'll make more sense for what i'm going to cover uh in a little bit here okay so uh here's an introduction to beetles the year was 1957 the place liverpool wait a second beetles members of the insect order coleoptera represent the largest of all of the insect orders, with over 400,000 described species. Uh, to kind of put that in perspective, that means that of all of the life forms described on planet Earth, one out of five is a species of beetle. Uh, the largest group of beetles is the uh, polyphaga, which includes the scarabs and such, with about 300,000 described species. Next in line in terms of beetle diversity is a group called the ataphaga, well, which includes the tiger beetles, ground beetles, and of course our bombardier beetles, with nearly 100,000 described species in that group. Uh, now the bombardier beetles themselves are, are actually highly diverse. There's about 400 species of beetle in the Atafaga that are considered to be bombardier beetles, meaning they can actually expel chemicals, uh, hot chemicals, at velocity from their abdomens. But what's very interesting about the Atafaga as a whole, meaning all of them, all 100,000 species of them, is that they are typified by having glands separate from the rectum that are able to expel quinones or hydroquinones, some at pressure, some without pressure, from their abdomen. So the whole group has the ability to expel these chemicals. It's not just the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle takes it one step further and is able to expel them at, at, at a high heat and high velocity, but we'll get into that. Um, but I think it's important to note that this characteristic exists within the entire group that the bombardier beetle belongs to. Also, uh, the fact the the ability to squirt chemicals in the bombardier beetles has evolved at least twice. There are two relatively distantly related lineages that ha share this ability, while other closer relatives do not have this ability. So that's kind of interesting in itself. Uh, and I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Ba talk a little bit here about the bombardier beetle, and we'll see, well, where he messes up. Of all creation is Brachenus coleoptera, the bombardier beetle. See what Carl did there? 
uh, by giving it a scientific name, a very impressive scientific name, Brachinus coleoptera, um, he first of all comes off as if he knows what he's talking about. Um, he doesn't. Um, but second of all, he's trying to imply that it's a, that there is a Bombardier beetle out there. That, you know, in all of the diversity of beetles, there's this one Bombardier beetle that has the abilities that he's going to describe to you now. Uh, there's there's a few few things that I do want to point out. First of all, Brachinus is indeed a genera, one of the genera of Bombardier beetles. One of them. There are lots of them. Remember, this is a very large and diverse group of beetles. Um, but Coleoptera, there's no Brachinus Coleoptera. Coleoptera is the order uh, of which all beetles belong to. So it's not called Brachinus Coleoptera. In fact, it's called... Uh, Stenoptinus insignis is the species that is shown there uh, from Africa. It's not the Brachinus group at all. So, anyway, I'm going to let him go on. Now, this little fellow is an absolute marvel. Uh, we have diagrams. We have some actual specimens of the bombardier beetle, but here's a photograph of him in action. In order to photograph him in action, a special camera had to be designed because he shoots this spray at 2,000 pulsations per second. They did not design a special camera to get the pictures of the Bombardier Beetle. Um, that, those photographs that Carl is showing here are from an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Link down below to a full text article online, you can read it yourself. Uh, where they talk about exactly what the researchers did to capture those images. No special design camera was required. And by the way, uh, uh, Carl exaggerated the number of pulses per second by a factor of four. I'm not entirely sure why, but just pointing it out. What happens is there are glands inside his body, inside this exoskeleton. The glands on one side secrete hydrogen peroxide. On the other side, the gland secretes hydrogen, uh, hydroquinones. These are shot into a chamber, but we've got a problem. When you mix those together, they're volatile. They explode. That would be an amazing thing um, if, it, if it had uh, one characteristic. Oh, yeah, if it was true. Uh, hydrogen peroxide and quinones or hydroquinones do absolutely nothing when mixed together. They don't heat up, they don't combust, they don't explode, they do absolutely nothing. Carl is wrong here. I will link to, uh, put a link down below, maybe I'll put an annotation if I'm not too lazy, of an excellent video featuring Richard Dawkins uh, where he mixes these chemicals together to show their non-reactivity. So waiting inside that chamber are enzymes that desensitize them so that they're just quivering, they're waiting. When we approach this little creature, or a larger ant approaches this creature, or a frog approaches, approaches this creature, or a dog, or a platypus, or a monitor lizard, or an orangutan, we get it, Carl. Go on. This little creature is able to turn this projectile under his legs, and his legs are insulated, by the way, that is jettisoned out at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the boiling point of water. It is a boiling hot mixture. He's able to jettison it under his legs, through his legs, to the left, to the right, above him, and behind him. It is absolutely incredible. But as he secretes hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide into this chamber, with a desensitizer, it's quivering, quivering, it's ready. And at 2,000 pulsations per second, as he shoots it out, with each pulsation is added a catalyst. That catalyst then removes the effect of the inhibitor and the jet mixture, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, is shot out. That's an amazing design. Can you imagine that little creature evolving? All right, I'm going to uh, give a simplistic explanation of how the Bombardier Beetle actually does what it does. Um, uh, let's, let's set aside uh, Dwayne Gish's and, of course, Carl's repeating of Dwayne Gish's outright frauds about it. Um, first of all, th what makes the heat, what actually produces the explosion in the Bombardier Beetle is not this mixture of 
peroxide and and um, the benzoquinone or quinones. Uh, what actually does what what actually causes it to function is hydrogen peroxide and a catalyst that causes the peroxide to give up one of its oxygen forming water and free oxygen. Now when this does it, this reaction is hot. This reaction releases a great deal of heat that causes the water to boil. So without any quinones of any kind, without any other chemicals, with just peroxide in their abdomen, these beetles would squirt out hot water, steam. Okay? Does that make sense? Now what they do though with the with the hydroquinones is these beetles actually convert the hydroquinones into a, it's called a p-benzoquinone, I believe. That's it's just slightly more noxious, more toxic uh, than the original. And what this quinones do is they're actually pushed out with the steam. Steam is the mechanism for release. Um, think of it as a, I think of the 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 quinones are acting as a uh, what do you call it? A shrapnel in a bomb. You have a bomb. You, somebody makes a bomb. Um, designed to explode and hurt people. Now they decide, let's, let's wrap a bunch of nails and crap around this bomb and make it even worse, right? That's what the quinone is. The quinone is, so they're ejecting this hot steam, so they're adding to the hot steam other noxious chemicals that will additionally cause harm to the predator. That's what's going on with this. The benzoquinone and the peroxide are not reacting at all. Um, so just please in, indulge me here for a second. I'm going to use one of my analogies. I think this might be a way I can explain um, this this concept uh, of irreducible complexity as used by creationists in such a way. Um, so I'm going to go to narration. Uh, I apologize for the crappy drawings. Imagine you're walking and you come across a tall pillar with a round stone on top of it. Uh, there are no other pillars. There are no other stones in sight. Uh, try as you might, you cannot imagine any possible way that a person such as yourself could have gotten a stone on top of that pillar. Uh, you, you devise many different mechanisms, none of them pan out. Uh, but let's just say another scenario, you come across the stone with a, this pillar with a stone on top of it, but next to it are other pillars, some with stones and some without. Um, on the ground, there are ladders, on, and leaning up against some of the pillars, the ladders are still there. Now you think, wait a second, I see the original one, somebody put the stone up there and then moved the ladder. Uh, so what, the point of this little exercise is when creationists take something like the Bombardier Beetle and they show it to you as a single entity, they want you to believe that it's this. When in reality, when we look at the diversity within this group and related forms, uh, other ground beetles, what we're actually seeing is this. Hopefully my silly analogy made some sense. I was trying to illustrate the idea of why these creationists will present a case like this as if it's a single thing, as if it's a single standalone case um, with no close relatives, with no plausible pathways for its evolution. When in the case of the Bombardier beetle, we have... Well, we have lots and lots of very plausible pathways because of the fact that within the group of, of beetles that we call Bombardier beetles, there are those that eject the hot steam, there are those that don't eject the hot steam, there are those that have nozzles for aiming, there are those that don't have nozzles for aiming. Um, we have very, very primitive Bombardier beetles that simply squirt out a uh, very short distance these quinone chemicals um, in the face of their attacker. We have others that are able to squirt it out with hot steam at a great a greater distance. We have those that are able to aim with a nozzle and shoot all the different directions like Carl showed. Um, essentially, we can reconstruct the mechanisms, the pathways for the evolution of the advanced Bombardier beetles, um, looking at simply the ones that are alive today, um, the wide diversity of those. Um, and it's in their best interests not to share that information with the audience um, because, well, it kind of makes the mystery dissipate when they do. So I ran out of time. Um, I was going to talk about yucca moths, which if you, it's a common creationist claim that these, these yucca plants can only be pollinated by this yucca moth. Um, without each other, they both would go extinct. And how could this evolve? Um, to make it short, uh, the reality is both yucca plants and yucca moths are also highly diverse, with some being obligate and some being faculative, meaning that some yucca moths can pollinate a wide variety of other flowers, 
Um, some yucca moths can only pollinate one species of yucca plant. Some yucca plants can be pollinated by flies and bees and stuff. Some can only be pollinated by this moth. So we see this again, um, the whole evolutionary spectrum that leads to this very, very tight-knit mutualism, mutualistic scenario that the creationists are talking about.